Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Telemedicine Echo. My name is Beth Munson, and I am the coordinator for this Echo. And today joining me is our newest coordinator, Brianna Sapp. Hello. We work for Missouri Telehealth Network and Show Me Echo at the University of Missouri and Columbia. Um, I'm now going to turn this over to Evelyn, and she's going to get us started. Good morning, Evelyn. Good morning. Uh, great to see everyone online this morning. Today we're going to be talking about multi-state perspectives on telehealth workflow. So I'm fortunate to have our state colleagues, um, Rachel Mutro from Missouri, Tim Davis from Oklahoma, and uh, Molly Brown uh, as our moderator today. I'm going to go through some uh, uh, nuts and bolts slides fairly quickly. Uh, when we get to the more detailed workflow uh, slide, um, really want to hear from our state colleagues, as well as folks on the um, the, the call today. Um, I think when you've seen one workflow, you've seen one workflow. So we'd love to learn uh, from you things that you may have seen useful um, as, as your teams have planned workflows. So just to kind of orient us, um, this is a slide that I know you have seen before throughout the course of meeting together over these months. Um, as we think about steps to implement team-based care in telemedicine, we've talked an awful lot about defining and engaging your team. I know many of you all are joining as teams, so you've already uh, checked off the box for number one. Um, we've talked some about choosing a model, and th that um, that means are you know are you going to see uh, um, folks synchronously in real time video conferencing like we're meeting today, or is it more asynchronous? Are you looking at uh, patient to provider telehealth models, or are you looking at more provider to provider? That's what uh, the choosing the model means. Um, today, we're going to focus in on um, steps three and four, so developing team-based team care workflows and implementing workflows. And then I know we have a session coming up. I'm not sure if it's the next month or the one following about how to it iterate and optimize the model and really looking at some of the measurement and metrics. I want to get... Uh, kind of set us up in talking about workflows by going back a little bit to what we've talked about in previous sessions. Um, workflow, of course, really builds upon a foundation of trusted relationships, um, really similar to what we ha had uh, Robert uh, share in our last session. Um, really thinking about uh, all the relationships we have, both on center stage, so relationships with patient and family, uh, with our telebehavioral health providers and teams, and then also um, if we are connected at a supervised site, uh, looking at the local, par local partner site and clinical presenter or others who may be involved in the telehealth encounter. Um, but really thinking more broadly, also those folks who um, make telehealth possible behind the scenes, so um, across leadership, administrative teams, technical teams, teams, um, communication and marketing teams, and quality. And then even more broadly, looking at our community partners, um, both uh, champions and stakeholders. So today, I know we're going to talk quite a bit about that center stage with workflows. But as we go from workflow on paper to workflow in reality, um, we really want to think about how can we have the the patient's perspective built into that workflow and how we had lots and lots of eyes look at that workflow and pilot that workflow before we're ramping up and um, and going uh, going live with multiple sites. Um, again, building on this theme, um, this slide is just my reminder slide that um, good communication and trust, it, it really, it underlies good um, and healthy workflows. Um, this slide is my reminder that with telehealth, we're almost always talking about soccer and not golf. 
So really that idea about each team member is bringing an important piece and that important piece is also reflected in the workflow. Um, with this, um, we do, I know we've talked in other sessions about team building, about uh, good communication. Um, Karen Edison, I know early on, helped us think through some of the clinical and team communications and web, web kit. Um, I think uh, you all may have encountered the term psychological safety, but I think when we're looking at workflows, that term is super important. It's the idea that the, the team and systems really trust one another. Um, so when when something's working great in workflow, that's great. But when something's not working great or there's challenges, kind of it's that trust and psychological safety so folks can share that and continuously make things better. Um, teleteaming is just the idea that we're all distributed at multiple places. So some folks who um, may contribute to the workflow, um, they may not be right on site. It may be folks from multiple locations. You may be joining up in a, a Zoom meeting just like we are today to, to provide in, input on the workflow. And then, um, Again, building on what we've talked about earlier around readiness assessment, workflow is a piece and, and kind of more one of those mid to later pieces of readiness assessment. Um, this is just a reminder that um, it, in starting with readiness assessment and, and really the surveys y'all took at the beginning of, of this ECHO series, it kind of gets folks thinking about the who, what, where, when, how, um, and gaps with that. So it's kind of continuously looking at that um, as, as the service becomes more defined and, and folks have gone through some of that detailed planning, then workflow is kind of, again, toward the mid or later part where you're putting it on paper, you're having some, some uh, telehealth flow that then you can test out. So when we think about workflow development, um, one really, I think, important take home is look at the, the tools and processes that already exist within the organization uh, when any new clinic or service is started. Um, sometimes we get so excited about the technology um, and it, it is super cool um, that we forget that, oh, well, these folks have expertise already in the um, workflow when setting up uh, the on-site clinic. How can we use that same expertise with what we're doing? So looking at the steps in workflow flow development, um, first, we're going to think about creating a workflow diagram with specific tasks and responsibilities associated with each step in the patient's journey. Um, I think with that step, we often think about good enough is good enough. So we want a level of detail and a place to start. Um, but starting with th that's good. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it's good to have our best guesses and then move forward with some of the piloting that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the second step is bringing the team together to discuss which role is most appropriate for each duty. Um, and then finally, clearly defining and assigning the roles and responsibilities of each team member. This is just to kind of get um, folks thinking about the different uh, buckets that are involved with workflow. These are some common um, workflow buckets. Uh, it's not to say that there's not other buckets that may fit your particular situation. So um, looking at establishing the schedule, um, lots and lots of thought and time goes into that, uh, especially when we have very busy uh, providers and trying to think how it, you know how is that schedule going to look. Um, the second is identifying patients. So looking at um, both our inclusion, who, who are in our patient uh, population, as well as looking at who is not a fit. So um, trying to define from the beginning um, what patient population that we're trying to recruit. 
The third uh, bucket is looking at uh, schedule, scheduling the consult, creating the encounter. So really uh, partnering with our administrative friends um, to really um, have their help and support. It's really that interplay often of our electronic health record in our telehealth. Um, so uh, really getting folks across both on board uh, with the service and, and the workflow. Um, thinking about number four and how the consult will be completed, how information is, is entered, um, and then closing the encounter, um, especially things around uh, billing and coding, uh, thinking through the reimbursement component. And then finally, six is super important, um, how to complete follow-ups. Um, so really, six, of course, really uh, feeds into how can we make sure we're doing um, excellent care coordination in telehealth um, and getting the patient to the to the right place, both with um, if there's a telehealth second visit, as well as referrals to other services. This next series, I'm gonna go through three different workflows. It's not really to look at the details, but um, just to have the idea that um, workflows can look different. There's no right or wrong model. So this is a pretty sim simple workflow, but it really fits the clinic. Um, so it just kind of describes the specific steps with a follow-up visit. Some workflows may have more this diagram form, and that's also great. And then on the more uh, complex or side, um, you know, you, you may have institutional software or um, processes that really help um, with this more specific mapping out of workflow. But again, none of these these types are again. You may have something that even you know looks different than the the three that we've just shown. But all that's okay. Is it a the question comes down to is it a good communication tool that helps your team go to the specific steps um, and really uh, then implement uh, the the workflow? I'm going to go quickly through these steps. Um, and then really uh, have our, our partners weigh in on, on things that they've seen as they've developed workflows. Um, so I think when you look at a workflow, the first is kind of to follow it like that hopscotch path and kind of go through and think exactly what does this look like for the patient as they're walking through. So from scheduling the appointment um, to screening the patients, confirming the appointment, obtaining consent, receiving instructions and appointment confirmation. Um, so that's all the pre work till we get to the appointment. And then patients are looking at logging in, um, greeting the patient, um, the uh, having the visit, um, um, any kind of vitals that need to be taken ahead of the action, the, the, provider to patient visit, um, with the provider preparing for the appointment, um, being in the virtual space, um, and then evaluating, meeting and evaluating the patient and making recommendations. And then making sure there's time built in for the uh, patient being able to ask questions. Um, and then also um, acknowledging um, and working with the staff to, to help with the follow-up. Um, and then kind of continuing on, uh, looking at any kind of patient education needs, um, and then closing the encounter. Um, and then, you know, the, the patient leaves knowing what the next steps are. Um, I think there's, there's, um, kind of walking through it, but what can really help sometimes with the workflow and gelling the workflow is more kind of a role play. And I know role play can sometimes be a four letter word for folks because it takes us out of our comfort zone. So I know one of my colleagues calls it a low intensity simulation. Um, it doesn't take great actors, but it just takes kind of, um, I do think it's really useful for 
um, people, uh, our administrative team or provider team to put that patient hat on and kind of walk through, as well as having a patient walk through the workflow. I'll toss it to my uh, Missouri and Oklahoma colleagues. Are there any pearls or, or things you all do with your workflows at this step? Hi, everybody. This is Rachel from Missouri. I think that the thing I would add here that makes um, it particularly difficult is when we're talking about a workflow that is less than 10% of your normal day spent or week spent. Um, and so it's it's creating an exception to um, the other workflows that happen in your clinic. And once I think in the future, when everyone is using telehealth and it's more normalized, then, then you won't have that tension where it feels like it's sort of a one-off every single time. Um, and so to build it initially as comfortable as you can the same way as all the other um, provider visits are is, is the best way to approach it. Um, I did just meet with a pediatrician rec recently um, who said that every, she tries to see as many patients as she can on telehealth. However, there are all these issues with the technology. Every single time there are issues with just, it's ongoing. So she has to be the one that is sort of carrying the water for um, making this telehealth program move forward. And so finding those real champions that are going to go through it, even though it's kind of hard and when it's so, when it's such a small piece of your work life. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good morning. I'm Tim from uh, Oklahoma. Uh, I would just kind of reiterate everything Rachel and, and uh, Eve Lynn have, have said. Really, um, I kind of come from more of a technology background myself. So um, really test, test, test. You know, like, like Rachel just mentioned, technology is great when it, when it works, but uh, there's going to be times maybe the, the set scope isn't connecting or your, your scope or lens. So uh, having a backup uh, in, in place. So if, if this doesn't work, you know, what can we do to go ahead and make your visit um, complete um, and not have to reschedule? Uh, I think another thing is just to, I think it was mentioned earlier as well in the slide, but um, how do we support non English speaking patients? Do we have interpreters on the patient side or the provider side? Do we implement technology somehow to uh, let that translation happen? Uh, and like again, it's been said before, it, it's one size doesn't fit all. I think there's a good template um, that's out there. No, no reason to reinvent the wheel, but customize it that fits your your current workflows. As Rachel said, kind of keep it very similar to what it's already in the clinic, um, so it doesn't seem like it's this weird afterthought. And uh, maybe use it, you know, a few times per week, um, and a provider's out for a week or two on a vacation and come back and they're just not familiar with it anymore. So test, go through things uh, from a provider standpoint, the patient standpoint, and the, the telehealth coordinator staff, um, have everyone kind of be in everyone's other's roles um, to see how everything works and maybe we can anticipate uh, some upcoming problems. But um, I'll stop there as well. Super, that it's, those are awesome examples. I think it, also, it just reminds me at workflow planning time, it needs to be a really big table where you, you have all your, your technology expertise. Um, if you are you know, serving a patient population with multiple language or developmental needs, having those experts at the team table too. So I, I appreciate um, both of those excellent uh, points. Just uh, building on some of, of what we've we've um, shared already, um, I think ha hand in hand with the the work workflow diagram is also setting a specific and realistic timeline for implementation. Uh, rule of thumb with our telehealth resource centers is it often takes eighteen months from idea 
to um, opening the doors on that particular telemedicine service. I think um, with the public health emergency, um, we've gotten used to speeding up those timelines. So we'll see how that looks in future. But just um, knowing that testing out these steps, you know, starting small and then growing, um, really thinking about what, what is a, a doable timeline that's going to set it up for success. Um, starting simple by making one straightforward um, yet impactful change in workflow. Um, just with the idea that it doesn't have to be all or none. Um, as as uh, Tim mentioned, you know, maybe it's looking at some telehealth um, while while someone's away, or you know, d just maybe starting with half a day a week and then growing, um, but but kind of making it more incremental. Um, being flexible with the plan schedule, um, but making progress. Um, start with a small pilot of teams that are early adopters to work out challenges with the workflow. Um, and, and this may be done with your existing support team mem members to minimize expense. Um, and from there, then, um, you know, getting the co continuous feedback from folks who are using the workflows, um, scheduling times that the workflow teams, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> plan to meet and review and update the workflow. Um, you know, at first, this is more often where you may meet weekly and then monthly and then uh, twice a year and then once a year. Um, just making sure there's mechanisms in place that the workflows can continuously be uh, refined based on um, everybody's input. I think with telehealth, this really stands out because there are new technologies. There are a lot of policy changes that are impacting telehealth, which we've, we've heard throughout this series uh, with Rochelle and other folks. So that's why um, having a little more frequent telehealth workflow uh, reviews can sometimes be useful. Kind of, um, we, we, of course, want to make sure that our workflows are working for our patients. Um, but this is the other side of a, the coin and also thinking through any workflow and things to optimize practitioner skills and resilience. I think um, throughout this uh, series, we've also heard just um, how many shortages in workforce there are and telehealth can be a piece of addressing some of the workforce shortages. On the same uh, front, it also can be where practitioners are so eager to serve that they may, uh, you know, overbook or not think through some of the um, good kinds of um, visit care um, that's going to make them be able to provide services over a long period of time. Um, so in, when you're thinking about optimizing the environment for the practitioner, um, you know, thinking about the good computer monitor and camera placement, um, thinking about monitors at the appropriate height of the desk uh, so that the um, provider is not always having to look up or down, um, scheduling breaks between sessions and stepping away from the screen, um, considering the use of a standing desk. Um, adjusting the monitor brightness for comfort, aiming for space that's free of distractions it, as the providers um, de delivering services, and then finally um, considering uh, using a quality and comfortable headset. I'll ask uh, Tim and Rachel, is there any other things with optimizing the environment that you all have found really useful uh, for uh, providers and their own workflow? I would just go back and mention that a lot of providers um, and organizations find it difficult to decide whether or not to block specific time for telehealth versus uh, integrating it or just, you know, it, into the practice where they're seeing patient one patient in person and then one over telehealth. And um, when you have to 
when you have to do that kind of multitasking, it does make it harder on the provider. Um, I don't think it's impossible, but I think that, that people need to be intentional and think through the pros and cons of either blocking a half day for just telehealth patients. Um, and maybe that's the day that the provider can work from home versus uh, integrating it into part of the regular workflow at the clinic. Can I just say something here? I've done it both ways for many years. And while logistically it's probably easier to block time, I used to do Teladerm every Thursday morning for years and years and years. Uh, when we when we switched to doing it, just working it into everybody's schedule routinely, um, that's better for patients because um, you know not everybody can come on Thursday morning, right? Not everybody can show up on Thursday morning. It's probably better for providers just in terms of our health because you're walking and seeing patients. I remember sitting doing a half day of teledermatology. You're, you know, sitting is like the new smoking, right? So we don't, sitting is not really great for our health. You can't do a whole day of sitting. It'd be like being on a Zoom meeting all day, but worse because your patients come in more frequently. So instead of getting up for once an hour, you get up for however often your patients go in and, and you know what I mean by up where you lots of energy and enthusiasm, you know, and, and that is exhausting. And so I was always sort of exhausted, but I would never, you can't ask a provider to do a whole day of that sitting in front of a screen or even standing in front of a screen. If you're going to do it at one time, I would do it at a half day. So I just, I just wanted to say that. We do have a question in the chat box uh, related to this as well. Um, they're interested to hear if others use space for the provider where others are located as well. They're looking for noise reduction options. So I'm assuming it would be, is it a separate space, their own office? Is it in a central location? Those, I, I, I think I have that right, Rhonda. If not, please chime in. I'll just jump in. Um, I know what we've tried to do is provide kind of its own space. So if a clinic has room, uh, an extra patient room, we can convert one. Um, so again, we have a uniformity. Uh, providers could just use that as, as uh, Karen was mentioning, you know, not try to have a provider, you know, an eight hour um, telehealth session. Uh, but again, try to have that, that uniform, that way you can have the background, it's nice and clear that we know the equipment is there and it's been tested. Um, having said that, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes we have clinics that just don't have that, that space or room. So we just try to make sure that uh, the provider might be in their own office. But again, just kind of revisiting their office and background and technology that they're using to make sure it is um, quality and, and works, works correctly. Um, so I hope that maybe help answer Rhonda's question. And, and as far as noise reduction, um, you know, just trying to do, I think it was mentioned earlier, high quality uh, headsets versus even earbuds, I think, work better and, and kind of uh, tone out some of the other uh, noise. And um, just maybe even reminding if you do have to do it from um, a spot that maybe can be a little bit loud, you know, maybe even have a sign that if you go into that specific room maybe have a sign up that you, you hang or, or, or let someone know, hey, we're you know, kind of with a patient. Um, so just try to have that in a quieter um, spot if, if you can. Thank you. No. I think that answered it for her, thank you. It's a great segue to talking about taking breaks and considering grounding exercises because it is kind of a balance. You can't have tele, um, medis, telehealth providers can, can feel more isolated. So there's pros and cons to being you know, connected, be it in a shared office. Um, if, if the provider is not in a shared office, um, thinking about planned ways to connect with other colleagues so that um, telehealth doesn't become more isolating. Um, 
Karen really summarized this well with the point before, um, just, you know, building the time into the workflows and schedules for bathroom bakes, you know, meals, documentation, and, and just, um, you know, silence for a minute, um, be it um, taking a break too, and, you know, taking a walk outside, or um, using a grounding exercise to be more in the, the moment, all those can be useful. <coughs> and again, it, it's helpful to get the administrative staff on board with those breaks as well, um, so that then the provider isn't booked appointment after appointment after appointment. Um, Do you have any other questions in the chat, Molly? Not at this time. Super. Um, just as, as we, we've talked more about the workflow with the inter, individual, um, the, the specific telehealth service, it's just also a reminder that we're thinking at big, bigger pictures with different organizational roles and responsibilities. Um, this does track to our workflows. So it's kind of saying at the organizational level, at the, the telehealth provider site and the outreach site, um, just getting on paper what the roles and responsibilities and expectations are. No one likes surprises. Patients don't like surprises. Our partner organizations don't like surprises. So it's the idea that we're saying um, up front, this is what we anticipate. It's not to say that it's, it's not, can't be updated and changed, it sure can, but just kind of um, getting on paper what, what the expectations are. So I'm not gonna go through each of the different um, points. It's more just the idea that the special organiz organization is sharing uh, what what their roles and responsibilities are, as well as the, the spoke uh, sites are sharing that. And um, this is my uh, final slide. This is the most fun slide, I think, of this presentation. Uh, we've talked a lot about the virtual visit, so way on the right-hand side. Uh, really thinking through workflows and how do we um, how do we implement our telemedicine? I think it's exciting times where we're also seeing all these other technologies um, being introduced to our clinics and our work with patients. So as we look through to workflows in the future, we may be thinking about it's a workflow with. Te telehealth and, and telemedicine, but how does our workflow also engage these other types of technologies? Um, I really do hope you check out some of the resources um, that um, Molly and uh, others have helped us assemble. Um, the the uh, National uh, Telehealth Resource Centers have put a lot of time and thought into some sample workflows. Um, the other one I really wanna give a shout out is that early on in the pandemic with this telemedicine at ECHO, we were really fortunate to have Faye McDonald present on workflows. Um, so that's the top resource. Uh, so I, th I think hers is really useful. Um, her, her day job is telehealth workflows. Um, so she just has a lot of really good information about how to actually put things on paper. With that, I'll end and we'll, we'll go to uh, folks' questions and comments. We'd love to hear your experience with workflows. Um, both what, what's gone well and, and, and uh, pearls of wisdom as well as uh, things that may have been more challenging. Uh, I have a question for those of you who are in organizations that are doing telehealth and that have done telehealth, um, especially through the pandemic. My question is, is the workflow, did the workflow during the pandemic was, did it really, um, did that workflow stick to what you're doing now or did things change 
or revert to something pre-pandemic um, over the past year or so. Anybody have any thoughts on how things have changed in your own organization? Oh, I'll just say, I know in ours, maybe hasn't changed a lot, but just fine tuned and, and tweaked here and there. Um, I think we had a fairly good starting point. And of course, that certainly helps if you start um, out fairly well. But uh, I wouldn't say there has been a major, major ch change in ours, uh, but we already kind of had the software uh, and had already been looking at, at um, some telehealth offerings. So really, I think it just kind of um, move that up in, in the um, calendar, uh, I guess, so to speak. Thanks, Tim. I know here at our own organization um, at the University of Missouri during the pandemic, everyone was using uh, Zoom, Zoom licenses. So individual providers had those available to them. And since then, um, they have basically kind of taken those away from people, uh, for lack of a better word, and using a different system that's integrated into the electronic health record and I and that system is not um, it's not as easy um, as the other one. Rachel I was a patient in that system. Um, I visited the allergy clinic last week and it was funny being a telemedicine patient and I kind of panicked because I couldn't figure out how to get on and it turned out they sent me an email to click on, but not till right before my visit. So just as a patient, you know, you need to be, they probably told me that was going to happen, but you know, you're busy, you know, you can't expect patients to spend, you know, a lot of time preparing for the visit, right? Because they have busy lives too. So it has to be really easy and self-evident what's going to happen. And Karen, I would point out that when you have families that may want to come to an appointment, those systems that drop that link right before the appointment means it's impossible to share, it's impossible. My mom has dementia. I like to go to her appointments. I can't get the link. Um, so anyway, we have to think about, sometimes we don't understand <laughs> what we think is better can get in the way of what is simpler and can be more, more user-friendly. So Good it's point. interesting the effects of some of this sometimes. Karen, and I, I would just add, you know, I think it's maybe it's not a good thing that you're ha having to be a patient, but I mean, I think it is a good thing to help you as a provider, even so you again fully understand that patient perspective. Maybe when you implement that software, you know, hey, this sounds cool, and they'll just drop right down and, and they just click that link, you know, they get it two minutes before their scheduled time. Well, you know, Robert was saying there's a good example of that sounds great in, in theory and it works technically, but it's not best always. So uh, I think it's just always good to keep getting that open eye and, and even do survey feedback with the patients and see what, what you can find, what they like and don't like. We do have a couple of comments in the chat box. The first is um, their process hasn't changed with the reduction in COVID. In their program, providers are providing only telemedicine services to schools the providers are not seeing patients in the office as this is a school-based service. The question is, are there any other others with a similar program providers with providers serving only telemedicine? I can, I can comment just from some uh, contact we've had through the HTRC where there are uh, clinics that during the pandemic had shifted to telemedicine like many did. And now they're saying, they're seeing about a 90% uh, through telemedicine. So they're having to adapt and change their workflows and also how they do in-person visits, not to mention having to adjust with the um, policies and guidelines that are shifting with the end of the, the public health emergency. So we've seen some inquiries coming into the HTRC about, the, about that and what that might look like in terms of how they do the monitoring of their workflow, changes they may need to make, how, and then how they stay within the guidelines for uh, services and billing and requirements in that way. 
you know, I'll just add, uh, again, beating that dead technology horse that I always seem to, but yeah, it really can change your, your technology uh, budget, um, you know, the, the Wi-Fi or, or internet in, in your office or provider space, um, just the equipment it, itself. Maybe you have multiple providers, maybe you want to have um, more scopes or lenses, um, a different Bluetooth stethoscope, things like that. So I think it can um, add and, and change your budget, um, not always for the better, but uh, if it helps the patient and, and works out, then uh, things will be worth it. I'll add in um, with our um, telebehavioral health services. We've had a couple of folks who've gone from seeing a, a mix of on-site and telehealth patients. Um, just recently, we've had several go more to private practice and doing all telehealth. Um, some of that that's fitting their, their uh, work-life integration and families. I know one of our providers that's done that, it's allowed her to then be close to her, 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 um, her um, elder parents and, and really help support them as well as provide service. Another comment is that um, our providers adopted a workflow for telehealth as a result of the pandemic. The workflow has changed slightly and improved over the past two years, but it remains very similar to what we started with. And then in some instances, it looks like adopting the telemedicine pro uh, services is changing the floor plan more than anything. Um, so regarding the floor plan, is that the uh, actual geography of placement of these services, or are you talking in terms of how um, hospital floors or service floors change what they do. Just a little clarity on that. Location of providers in the clinic, whether they have treatment rooms, et cetera, right? So the placement of the services, if you have a dedicated space versus a floating space, right? And that's definitely something that it can, it can do over time. You test it as um, Evelyn presented, you, you test your workflow, you see what works and doesn't work, and then you make adjustments and shifts as needed to make those accommodations. And one of them, of course, is the noise, um, noise levels and then... Um, whether you have a dedicated day time or you integrate it within your schedules. Holly, I just wanted to go back to the first question that we had. Um, when I, I think about our, our pediatric behavioral providers in the start of the pandemic, we, we, we didn't have our script down and it wasn't building our workflows of getting in the patient's hands and the, the parent's hands ahead of time. You know, um, is, does the child need to be at the appointment as well as the parent? Because, and, you know, um, we had patients come in in their PJs, which is sometimes okay, but um, also just kind of thinking about like pa parents and children, they don't know what they don't know. So it's really, I think, helped with our workflows and our provider satisfaction as we've done a better job getting that in the hands of families. Um, And I think um, during one of the slides, just the, the more the more complex hopscotch workflow that you showed, uh, that that piece that makes sure the patient education is there on the how tos and the what to expect. Some of the and I've been on the other end of a telehealth appointment as the patient as well, and it was integrated into the patient portal, so you had to log in, so it wasn't just the link. So there's all these different nuances that and. Had, I had never accessed the patient portal prior to that, the telehealth visit, but I, I guess it existed the entire time I'd been a patient. So it's those types of things that um, uh, can also be just those little nuances that exist that can be very helpful on the patient end. Looks like Christina has her hand raised. Go ahead, Christina.
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yes. My question is, it, it pertains back to the uh, pandemic versus the non-pandemic. And we are telepsychiatry. The problem that some of our patients are going to face is that when it reverts back, my understanding is, is that the law is written now that the doctor has to see the patient within a six month time frame before he does a televisit and then once a year. What are we going to do with those patients that are in those outlying very rural areas that really can't travel to the office and the doctor can't spend two hours driving to see them? Christina, I'll, I'll start, um, but then I'm gonna hand it off probably to uh, Robert and some other people. But but it it comes back to who the payer is on, in a lot of cases um, and what state you're in. So Missouri, Kansas, uh, and Oklahoma all have different state regulations. Um, if you're, in patients, you're in Missouri, and if your patients are covered mostly by commercial versus mostly by a government payer, that's gonna make a big difference about what is going to happen after the pandemic. I, I will also say that, uh, and then I'll hand it Robert over to you, but I will also say that I am fairly optimistic um, that the federal government is gonna make some permanent changes uh, to the way that, that, that they see telehealth in the future. Um, it might seem it might seem like it's never going to happen, but I do have I do have faith that it is going to happen. Right now, we're covered at least until December of this year, isn't that right, Robert? Yeah, and there are some things that are, are then put on a timeline after the end of the public health emergency. So, um, and I can talk whenever you're ready, Rachel. I always have something to say. You know me. All right, well, I'll go ahead. I mean, the thing is. This was an unintended consequence. They thought um, in one of the uh, funding bills, they thought they were doing a good thing, right? By permanently expanding behavioral health, behavioral telehealth access. Um, and instead, this six month thing is really a big issue on behavioral health services. Um, there's a couple of things, A, with psychiatry. Um, I'm not sure that doesn't qualify as a medical, um, which, uh, you know, so we can, we can get a clarification from Rochelle who, uh, Martin, who works with us on policy and as well as billing. Um, but the second thing is, um, like Rochelle said, I think there's a, Rachel said, excuse me, too many <laughs> R words. Um, there is a real effort um, to, to deal with this and hopefully deal with it prior to it flipping to this. During the public health emergency, the six month doesn't, isn't required. Um, and hopefully with so much going on, um, this, this can be fixed, um, you know, I think there is, and there's already some, you know, sort of weakening of it in terms of how CMS is talking about it. And Rachel was perfectly right. That's CMS, so it's specific to Medicare. Um, and then state Medicaid can, and Missouri has, you know, one of the most embracing of telehealth Medicaid programs in the country. Um, so I think for Medicaid, it's not gonna be an issue. And then of course, when it comes to private insurance, you're gonna have to look at, um, what the private insurance requires. I don't think we're gonna see the six month requirement embraced system-wide. I think it's gonna potentially continue to be an issue in Medicare, um, but I don't see state Medicaid programs following suit. And the final thing is like everything else, first of all, these things can be changed through bills that um, impact. This has a financial impact, so it can go into anything that Congress passes related to spending. So a lot of these changes happen in stimulus bills or they change in the budget. Um, so especially we have in Missouri and Kansas and Oklahoma, federal legislators that are very much attuned to issues in rural areas. And so making sure your legislator knows how important it is or what an issue this is gonna be, especially for those populations that they're trying to do better for, that they see telehealth as a solution for like rural populations. These examples are exactly what your legislators need to hear because this can be fixed in any spending bill because it has a financial impact along with some of the other things that we'd like to see change permanently, like for health clinics and FQHCs being able to be distant sites. And as usual, I go on too long, but that's everything I have to say about it. And we will, we will confirm that psychiatry has that six month in-person requirement. 
I can just speak to the more the um, academic side of things, just to reinforce there, there isn't any data or th there's no compelling evidence that at such a six month visit or time frame um, improves care. So, you know, it, 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 it depends, you know, are you doing the very best telebehavioral health? You know, that's gonna make things better, but just to chime in that the data isn't really there to support such visits. Um, and then I appreciate Molly put in the chat. I know Rochelle Marting um, a lot mirrors what you just shared with us, Robert, um, but she had a, a webinar specific to that topic that, that might be useful for folks. We, yes, thank you. We actually, we have a couple um, and we do have, uh, we're working on an additional uh, webinar coming up in the first part of June with these emerging questions and some things that are specific. One of them was uh, related to Medicaid and that's gonna be state by state as well. Some states may follow uh, Medicare guidelines and some may not. So we will have a, a webinar coming up specific to that as well. If you're not, if you haven't signed up as part of our education series to get those alerts, you can go to our website and do that. Um, and then I will also drop our YouTube uh, link into the chat in just a moment as well. Because Rochelle is also available for one on one um, consultation through the TRC. So if you have a more specific situation, just extending that she'd be glad to chat as well. Thank you. Yes. So there was a more specific question related to does this psychiatry exemption apply to family medicine doing psych as well or just psychiatrists? This might be a, a specific question for Rochelle in terms of the terminology and what, what constitutes a provider and what that definition means, I use definition in air quotes. But so Heidi, if you would like to reach out to us um, via email, I'll put that in the chat as well. And I just yeah. confirm that the six month requirement also, even after the public health emergency ends, it will be at least 151 days. So that extends 151 days beyond the end of the pandemic. So. At least we don't have to worry that the pen that the emergency declaration ends and that triggers automatically. Um, and I think a lot of those things that they they recently put that 151 sort of delay on are things that they hope get fixed before the 151 day delay <laughs> goes <laughs> ends. So it clearly is something that I think Congress is trying to fix. Thank you, that helps me a lot because with those patients, as many of probably the physicians that handle psychiatry, it's an emergency basis many times. And when they're in outlying areas, we might be the only outreach that they have to help them to resolve the problem and prevent you know, um, hospitalization or sometimes uh, suicides. So thank you. We have a few minutes left if anybody has any additional questions. I am pulling up some other links to put in the chat for you. Evelyn, uh, do you want to make an announcement about the HRSA um, telehealth meeting next week? It's open to the public, right, the first two days? Yeah, um, that's a great point. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, do you have it up, Rachel? 
or Molly? I did. Yes, I'll <laughs> stick that in the chat too. Awesome, thank you. Just so it's HRSA is having a national telehealth conference at the beginning of the week next week. It's May 16th and 17th. I think it's all day on the 16th and then the morning of the 17th. Um, there are lots of good speakers, um, free to register. And uh, I think that if you've got some time or anyone in your organization has time, it'd probably be helpful. I think that those may be archived too, so we can check in to see if it's something we might be able to share after the fact. The uh, National Telehealth Conference begins on May 16th at 10, it's from 10 to 4, and then on the 17th, it's from 10 to 1230. So once you register, you will be, uh, you'll receive a couple of emails with links and, and things like that. There, that should get you there. Looks like I've filled you up. There's a lot of information in the chat. So we have our website for the TRC. I shared our email address, and then our YouTube channel has uh, recorded webinars with various topics, including the, uh, the ones that we were just talking about related to policy and guidelines. And then um, the HRSA conference, the National Telehealth Conference link is also in the chat. And if for any reason you have questions about any of these, you can always send us an email and our team will get back to you with, with um, links and other resources if needed. The next telehealth echo is um, June 14th and Rochelle Martin is going to present on billing and funding. And that's June 14th. That's perfect timing.